It's a good time to be here because we are in a series that we just recently started called Flipping the Script when Jesus was the one who was asking the questions. So in the book of Jeremiah, there is a fascinating dialogue we see taking place in chapter 12 between Jeremiah and God. It's fascinating for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is, is that Jeremiah is complaining to God. And before you throw stones at Jeremiah, let's just all be honest. We've all complained to God at times, right? We, come on now. We all have. I know you have. I have. We, yeah. And Jeremiah, he's, he's struggling. And what he's struggling with in particular is how the wicked always seem to prosper, whereas people like Jeremiah, righteous people like Jeremiah, always seem to suffer. And in a world where wickedness in our generation seems to be thriving, I can relate to that. You could probably relate to that. It's like, Lord, why do the wicked always seem to prosper? And so Jeremiah is bringing this complaint to the Lord. Now, if you're unfamiliar with who Jeremiah is, he was called to be a prophet to the nations. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was consecrated as a prophet even before he was born. Jeremiah 1 says this, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Oftentimes, the prophets to the nation of Israel also prophesied or gave uh, warnings or judgments to the nations around them. Now, if there's one thing we learn about the prophets in the Old Testament, it is that the calling to be a prophet often came with the calling to suffer, right? That's why I've always said, if you're ever called by God to be a priest or a prophet, be a priest, not a prophet, because prophets always suffer. And Larry Wheeland, he said, that's why we're, in, after the first service, he goes, that's exactly why we're a nonprofit organization. <laughs> I thought that was very, and he came up with it on the spot. I said, I got to use that next, next service. Of course, prophets suffer because they speak the truth. They say the hard things that need to be said. They give the warnings, the rebukes. Sometimes they speak of impending judgment from God. And that doesn't always go over well. Now, as I already mentioned, Jeremiah was growing tired of his suffering, and here's exactly what he has to say to God. Now, this isn't even our main passage for today. I just want to set up our main passage. This is Jeremiah chapter 12. This is what he had to say. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. <laughs> I love that opening line. Hey, Lord, you're righteous. I'm about to complain, so here we go. <laughs> Yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous th thrive. You plant them and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. But you, O oh Lord, you know me. You see me. You test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long, O oh Lord, will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? So Jeremiah, he's heavy in heart. Lord, the wicked are prospering. What is going on? Hurry up and bring judgment already. And if you've ever felt that way, you're in good company because the prophets often felt this way. Now, I'm not exaggerating with what I'm about to say because what I'm going to show you one of the coolest verses in all the Bible, and perhaps you've never even read it, but um, it is God's response to Jeremiah, and I mean it. It is one of the coolest responses in all the Bible. Here is what God has to say to Jeremiah. He says this, If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? I know, right? Isn't that amazing? You're like, it would be even better if I knew what it meant, right? Like, what in the world? What is that response? It's a cool response. You've raced with men on foot and you've grown weary. What do you think is going to happen when the horses break out? Here's what God is saying to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, if the suffering and injustice you've experienced thus far as a prophet has wearied you, which God says is equivalent to racing with men on foot, how do you expect to compete when even greater suffering and injustice comes your way, which God calls racing with horses? In other words, Jeremiah, if you think the suffering and injustice that has come your way thus far has been unusually exceptional, you haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. Now, why do I bring this up? Why do I start here? I start here in this passage because in the passage we're going to look at today and the question that Jesus poses to those that are listening to him, Jesus actually poses four back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back questions right in a row in which he challenges the people who think they are being unusually exceptional in the way that they're loving others. 
And just like the question that God poses to Jeremiah, the four questions that Jesus poses to his audience are going to reveal that there was nothing unusually exceptional whatsoever about the love that they were showing towards others. So church, it's my honor to take you to the word of God today. We'll be in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. Hear the word of God this morning. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he, God, makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now here are the questions that Jesus poses. Boom, 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 boom. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Amen, church, hear the word of God this morning. So in our passage, Jesus starts by dropping a bomb, and the bomb he drops has to do with what God expects from his children, specifically how they treat their enemies. See, the common teaching of the day is right here. Pardon me, right here. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I love it. I can do that. Can you? I like this teaching. It rests well with me. Love my neighbor and hate my enemy. It comes naturally. It comes naturally. So I'm digging this. But Jesus drops a bomb. See, the, the, the idea of loving your neighbor, that's biblical. That's in the Old Testament. But one problem was the religious leaders had narrowed down the definition of neighbor to only those people that they found acceptable or they, they personally liked. And so neighbor went from something big in God's mind to something very, very narrow that was being taught. Love those who love you back. Love those who treat you well. That's the only obligation you have before God. So people like tax collectors, sinners, Gentiles, we're not going to love them. They're our enemies. The religious leaders had lowered the bar so much that as long as they loved their small circle of friends, they assumed God was exceptionally pleased. God's pleased with me. I love those who love me back. Now, the phrase, hate your enemies, has no scriptural basis. Literally nowhere are we ever commanded to hate our enemies. It was simply a man-made tradition that, that the religious leaders came up with that they used to justify their ungodly behavior towards those they didn't find acceptable. Jesus blows this all up when he says this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's, that's far different. That is far different than that. This I like, this not so much. This is so much harder. In other words, if you want to do what is pleasing in God's eyes, show unusually exceptional Love, even to those you consider your enemies, even to those who persecute you. Folks, this would have been an absolutely mind-blowing, paradigm-shifting, earth-shattering teaching. It really would. It would have been like, what is this guy saying? Now, to drive home this point, Jesus poses the four questions that we see today. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? So all four questions that Jesus poses here drive to the same conclusion, which is this. You're not doing anything unusually exceptional. As a matter of fact, your standards, Jesus, in talking to the crowd, he says, your standards are no better than the very people you consider to be your enemies. For example, you think you're being unusually exceptional? by loving those who love you in return, <clears throat> even tax collectors who you consider to be traitors to the Jewish nation, even they love in that way. What's so unusually exceptional about what you're doing? And if you think you're being unusually exceptional by greeting only your brothers, even Gentiles who you consider mere dogs and a people rejected by God, even they greet in that way. What's so unusually exceptional about what you're doing? If you want to be and show unusually exceptional love and kindness, then go out of your way to greet those who have no friends. Invite people into your home whom everyone else has forgotten about. Do things like this, and you will be practicing religion that is unusually exceptional in the sight of God. 
And this is what God wants. He wants his children to be unusually and unusually exceptional people in a dead and dying world. Not a people who live to the world standards, a people who exceed the world standards, who have come, you and I, who are giving our lives away, who are dying to self and are serving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, imagine being in the crowd when Jesus speaks this. It would have been a tough pill to swallow. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What? I mean, that pill is huge. I see some of the vitamins that some of you take. They're huge. <laughs> right? I mean, the stuff they're cranking out today, it's just like, that, that's a vitamin? <laughs> this would have been a tough pill to swallow, especially for the religious leaders. They were the ones that advocated for this the most, of loving your, enemy, or loving your neighbors and hating your enemies. But even for the average Israelite, it would have been a tough pill to swallow because what Jesus is saying here is so incredibly hard. Amen? Is this not hard? Come on, you're not that righteous. It's hard. Let's just be honest. I can prove it. Think of the person on the other side of you, the other side of the aisle politically. Can you love them? Point, case closed. It's hard. To be perfectly honest, it's a tough pill for me to swallow. I've had 37 years as a Christian to work on this passage, and it's hard. It is hard. It is so much easier. It's so much more practical to be unexceptional in the way that I live my life for the Lord. I just want to be unexceptional. It's easier. It's quicker. It's it's less painful. I'm not even kidding. If there were a top 10 list of the most difficult things Jesus ever said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you has to be somewhere near the top, don't you think? It's got to be. It's got to be in the top five, top three. It might even be number one. Now, if you're like me, and you are, there are certain things that, you're, that Jesus taught that you just do well. You're exceptional in certain areas. Unusually exceptional. And it's a piece of cake for you. I said last week, I have no problem striving to be unusually exceptional when it comes to having good doctrine or watching out for false prophets, or being bold with the truth. I have no problem standing up here and saying what needs to be said. People go, oh, Bill, that's so amazing. It comes natural to me. Don't, that, that just comes natural. But being un- unusually exceptional in the love that I show towards others, in the kindness that I extend, in the mercy that I offer, that's an entirely different ball game. But you want to know what, folks? That is exactly the life to which you and I have been called. We have been called to live unusually exceptional lives in a dead and dying world in which we seek to please God, not the people around us, not the world around us. We seek to please God. And in case we're not sure what God wants, he wants us to die to self and live radically for him to store up treasures in heaven and hold the things of this world loosely to give our lives away whenever we can. That's one of the reasons that Jesus time and again, told those that followed him, count the cost. Count the cost of what it means to follow me because I am calling you to an unusually exceptional life in which you die to self and you serve me with all of your heart. So it's not just that we show an unusually exceptional love, an unusually exceptional kindness. There's so much more. We want to be unusually exceptional in every area of our lives. We want to be unusually exceptional in the mercy that we extend We want to be unusually exceptional when it comes to holiness, that we are a people whose hearts belong to God and that we are not flirting with the world or doing anything with the world, that we are walking that narrow road with him, that we show unusually exceptional courage, that we show unusually exceptional patience, that we show unusually exceptional hospitality, that we show unusually exceptional generosity. And the list goes on and on and on of the things that we have been called to. You wanna know why it's important, folks? Because when Christians are unusually exceptional, people's lives are powerfully changed. They just are. You wanna stand out, uh, uh, Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining or arguing so that you may shine like stars in a crooked and depraved generation. Do all things. Just that simple thing right there causes us to shine. When we live unusually exceptional lives, we will shine. Why do I tell you all that? This morning, the elders and the staff are excited to present to you one way that our church family can continue to show unusually exceptional love, kindness, and hospitality hospitality to the community around us. 
We're gonna show you plans to update our campus in a way that will allow us to continue to reach the community around us. And you wanna know why it's important to reach the community around us? Because we are a church that stands strong on the word of God in a world that has lost its way. That's why many of you are here, because we have God-centered worship and we're preaching God's word unapologetically. And I want people in this community to find churches like this. I know they're out there. There's good and faithful churches out there, but it seems like they're fewer and fewer. We're one of them. And we want people to come and experience what we experience every week. I hope you understand just how incredibly unique our church is. Folks, if there is any hope for our culture, our country, it's gonna be when faithful congregations like ours show unusually exceptional, not just courage, but hospitality and kindness. Last week, we preach, I, I preached on when Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Remember, I said that it, Jesus didn't need the loaves that the disciples had to feed the 4,000 people, but he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Why? Because he was allowing them to participate in his kingdom and in his work.